vous voulez en plus, en plus <rire> When I started shooting, the best guys I was shooting were the washing dishes. I started my career shooting dishwashers in a way. I was deeper in Perry Anderson's cleavage. But then over the years, ski films have progressed and changed. And we've tried to tell a story. And there's some great stories in skiing. And uh, that's what I've tried to do over, over the last 20 years. And it's been such an amazing journey. And now I'm just wondering if Maybe that journey is slowly coming to an end. As soon as fall comes, as soon as the first leaves start falling off the trees, I get this tension and I start thinking about things, overthinking things. I'm questioning whether I need to be doing this anymore. Is that really how you're going to start a film? That's crap. Is it? <laughs> really?
Fifteen years ago, Nicola Falke called me up one day and said, we'll do some stuff at night. I'm going to put some lights and we're going to shoot at night. I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Fifteen years later, I'm still night shooting. Appreciate it, Dave. Looks pretty good, eh? I don't know, actually. I think it does. <laughs> uh, I was a ski bum when I was filming my friend skiing. I had a camera and I was trying to figure it, figure it out along the way. Yeah, probably someone should have told me that everything I was shooting was a bit rubbish, but I kept at it and, and it was around 1998 I met Jill Barrel and the Falco brothers. And they were sort of the first pro riders I started working with. Dans toute ma carrière de skieur, le moment qui m'a le plus marqué ou qui me restera le plus ancré, c'est notre première journée de photo qu'on a fait ensemble. Euh, Guido, Yanchi, Loris et moi. Ça, c'est le, le déclic. Après, il y a eu plein de moments incroyables dans toute, la carrière, dans toute notre carrière. Mais c'était juste à ce moment-là, on se dit waouh, ça commence, il se passe quelque chose. Pour moi, c'était le free riding à ce moment-là. Le ski pad et le jump off cliffs. Et over the next 10 years, j'ai ended up working with a lot of other pro riders like Xavier and Jeremy Jones, Geraldine Fastnacht, Henrik Winstead. And by then, quite a few things had happened. Yeah, Jill passed away, and uh, Geraldine's husband, Seb, passed away. Jean Yves Michelot, who won the Verbi Extreme, got paralyzed. And I wasn't really questioning it too much then, but another 10 years have passed since, and now I'm really questioning why I'm doing this. To me, the skiing is just a filler. It's the story behind the skiing or the skier or the place or whatever. That's the interesting bit. You know, anything but free riding is all artificial. You know, the nature has given you something and, and you just take it as it is. I, I think free riding is more like exploring, adventuring going to new places, but still, still bringing the sport into it. Skiing is uh, it's my life. I climb mountains, I climb walls, and I ski mountains. For me, it's a sport that makes the adventure of a life. It's a way of expression that lets libre cours à, à toutes les imaginations possibles. I'm not doing it for anyone. I do, just do it for myself. I just want to, to be proud of myself. As soon as you start thinking too much of snowboarding like a job and all the negative aspects of it, then you might lose the passion. The cool thing in the mountains is that you don't have to, to judge people. It's more the, the spirit that you have in your head. You know, the mountain is strong enough to not having to focus on judging the other people that they ride. It's something I don't get tired of, yeah. Man, 
un bon freerider, c'est un vieux freerider. Donc euh, il, il va falloir que, bah, gérer des mauvaises expériences, euh, renoncer plusieurs fois. Et puis ça, y a, ça c'est l'expérience qui dicte. Je pense qu'à 20 ans en arrière, on a juste repopularisé un petit peu plus que certains euh, fous faisaient. Euh, maintenant, l'évolution, elle, 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 elle est évidente. On, une fois qu'on a exploité tous les petits carrés poudreuses autour des remontées mécaniques, une fois qu'on a exploité tout, toutes les pentes de poudreuses un peu plus loin que les remontées mécaniques, ben, on commence à s'enfoncer dans les montagnes et puis aller chercher des choses plus, plus, plus vierges, plus éloignées, avec de, de nouveaux défis. Je pense qu'il y a toujours été une chose qui m'a vraiment excité beaucoup dans le freeriding, c'est ce genre de moment où vous avez vraiment un peu plus de temps dans une saison ou même un peu plus de temps dans votre vie où vous ne pensez pas, mais vous juste part of the elements then you know exactly what to do and you just function and you just have like a lot of energy inside you this is it to me do we have a plan no <laughs> you no It's a balance, it's a teamwork and what Xav was um, taking uh, from, from my alpinism skills, I could learn from his uh, riding skills, so it's always a team effort. Things have changed a lot, like first with Xavier starting to do things on the snowboard that no one did before, how he explained that when he found the way to ride with the speed, he said, oh, I feel so comfortable. For any other people, it looks scary. The word crazy gets thrown around a lot. Is it crazy or calculated? I don't know. When your level is that high, everything you do seems crazy to someone whose level is not so high. It's quite simple. in every sport. You know, some people change the standards and then the kids, the generation that comes after, takes those standards as normal, you know. The young generation is still pushing and pushing and that's, that's really beautiful to see. Il y a 20 ans, on sautait des énormes cailloux en bordure des pistes. Après, euh, il y a dix ans en arrière, la tendance absolue, c'était de passer des, des, des semaines en Alaska pour rater euh, aucun bon run. Et puis maintenant, le, le but, c'est de camper dans, euh, au milieu des Alpes pour aller faire des classiques alpines. On peut imaginer que de futur, ce soit d'aller dans les Andes ou en Himalaya. C'est vrai que ça, là, ça m'échappe, c'est plus mon sport. Mais par contre, je ne peux pas critiquer ça parce que c'est le but de ce sport. Il faut que ça évolue. Et si je suis contre cette évolution-là, je suis un vieux con. Historically, extreme skiing has been pretty much you fall, you die. And I think in the last few years, free riding and extreme have kind of become one in a way. Yeah, what I do is definitely considered as extreme because if you fall, you die. But at the same time, you know, it's become kind of cheesy to use that name, so I don't like to use it. You know, to me, extreme is just going down, like kind of sidestepping down the mountain and finding a way down, and to me, I think uh, there's a lot more to, to steep skiing than just doing that. I do a lot of things where, where you can't fall, and I guess that means it's extreme skiing. But it's also a mix. I'm trying to take uh, free riding into the bigger mountains as well. If you want to keep on doing this kind of high mountain extreme skiing, I think you have to face yourself sooner or later. All these lines that Xavier and Sam and Jeremy have skied over the years, the 4,000 meter peaks notably, they are mostly classic ice climbing routes in the summer. I think there's 84 4,000 meter peaks in the Alps. 
20 I've shot at least with either Xavier, Jeremy, Sam or Geraldine. Pour moi, la différence, c'est ça, c'est qu'on peut être freerider, mais pas montagnard du tout. Et il y a des freeriders qui, qui sont montagnards. Moi, si je suis venu au freeride, c'est parce que je voulais apprendre la montagne. They have changed the sport to where, where it is now. And being there and seeing it and being in the midst of it has been mind blowing. You know, if you asked someone that 20 years ago, they would never think about what people can do nowadays in the big mountains with skis. Jeremy Hyde's. I never seen skiing like that in my life. It's true that the Alpes is a terrain incredible. After going to chatouille the 4000, it demands a little bit of experience. So we can have moments key that make you there at the right place at the right time, and then you can get out of lines completely incredible. pas plus fort comme euh, comme euh, comme émotion quand tu quand tu viens de skier et puis d'accomplir euh, ce que tu avais imaginé dans ta tête. I think in the, in the future we're going to see more and more like, crazy stuff also but it's it's the evolution of of ski. It's because it's become a career path and to keep being the best and getting paid more and getting more sponsors and whatever you have to push yourself and possibly you're pushing yourselves a bit further than you should. There's very little de margin. The moindre petite error peut peut coûter extrêmement cher. I think thin, things can go definitely further, but that involves more accidents, more uh, more risks. I, I think in a safe way, it's impossible to do it. If you want the sport to wear, you have to push yourself. But where do we want the sport to go to? You need a lot of faith in what you want to do. You can't just go out there and just try and go for it straight away. It takes a long time for you to be able to tick the thing off that you actually want to do. You have to start asking yourself the questions about your own life and I get fear of my own life and sometimes I get fear of myself. That's how things have evolved. Uh, the, the extreme has is, is gone way beyond what, what I'd ever consider doing. Um, and I, I think it's pretty dangerous now what's going on for both photographer, cameraman and, and uh, pro rider. And they're, they're pushing, they're really, really pushing their limits. I mean, are you happy with 55 degree slopes? No, no. Not anymore, yeah, right. well, neither am I. I've been always fascinated with the kind of extreme skiing thing. Never wanted to do it. And in 2005, I think it was around 2005, I met Andreas Franson. He was a Swedish guy who moved to Chamonix and started doing all the classic extreme descents. So I ended up shooting with Andreas a few times. One was with, uh, with Sam and they skied the Pan de Souk, which is an aesthetically amazing descent. We got it in the perfect conditions. Well, they got it in the perfect conditions. I was sitting in the helicopter. That really opened my eyes to what's possible an extreme descent in a free ride way. Then Andres went and yeah, he was doing trips to South America, and then one of these trips to South America, he got caught in a big avalanche. And it's things like that that you just keep questioning yourself all the time. Why am I doing this? Andreas was my best friend. That accident with Andreas passing, and literally, a handful of other people for just two, three years. I lost like five, six 
very good friends. And that definitely changed my point of view in looking at this profession. Every year there's one, two, three, maybe even more people that we know that, that, that are gone. And, and every time, you know, you, it's always so hard to just look at the mountains and, and still love what you do, you know, like not have any resentment for, for this sport. She's prêt. Okay, let's do Hello. The boating is freedom and je me coiffe. Hello. I'm really looking forward. Uh, je sais plus ce que j'allais dire. Um, snowboarding for me is. Je suis pas prête, Guido. Snowboarding for me is all about spending good times in the mountains with my buddies. C'était un rayon de soleil extraordinaire. Elle arrivait le matin. Elle avait un sourire jusqu'aux oreilles. Elle... Elle transmettait le bonheur autour d'elle et euh, déjà rien que pour ça, moi je savais, je me levais le matin, on allait rider ensemble, ça allait être une belle journée. On voyageait ensemble, on, on vivait des, des moments très forts ensemble, je l'ai vu, vu gagner deux titres, j'ai plus vibré pour son titre de second titre de championne du monde que moi quand j'ai gagné en fait. Elle avait, la, elle avait la capacité à, à partager les émotions qui étaient énormes. À accepter, c'est extrêmement difficile. Mais si en plus, euh, je me coupe de la montagne, où là, j'arrive à, à évacuer justement euh, la haine que, que j'ai en moi par rapport à ce qui s'est passé, ou aller me vider la tête et, et tout ça, bah c'est plus possible. Après l'accident d'Estelle, j'ai... J'ai pensé à arrêter et avoir peut-être, euh, on va dire, un parcours un peu plus normal. J'ai pris au jour le jour et, et voilà. C'est un environnement qui est bâtard, qui est aussi beau que dangereux finalement. Le premier you can't let, let, it, let it go, because if you let it go, then you're going to quit. I've had a few photographer friends who've been killed in avalanches. You know, I'm 70 years old now, and it's, uh, I'm, 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 I'm done with it. Yeah! It's coming here. Me and Mika just caught, caught in a little slide. Sam set off on the shop. We've lost, uh, we both lost our cameras. But we found the cameras, now we're just looking for skis. It's a little bit shaky. We're here, so it's good. Each time it's like, you come out and you go, oh, you're laughing, ha ha ha, we're all alive, it's brilliant. Yeah. But really, it's like, how close were we? How close was it that time? Je dis toujours qu'il faut arriver à assumer le risque, assumer ce qu'on fait et pas nécessairement l'accepter. Je me dis que si je devais accepter le risque, je serais prêt à accepter euh, d'aller euh, droit dans le mur. Oh 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 Jesus Le risque zéro, il n'existe pas et après c'est... Pour moi, c'est à nous de savoir jusqu'à quel point on l'accepte. Je suis conscient à 200% que ça arrive, ça arrive pas qu'aux autres les accidents. Il euh, y, y a eu plusieurs exemples qui, qui m'ont montré que ça pouvait très bien m'arriver du jour au lendemain. En 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, c'est parti. Oh non, 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 non. En aucun cas je me dis que... S'il m'est rien arrivé, il va rien m'arriver. Ça, c'est faux de dire. Et puis, c'est justement en ayant ce raisonnement-là que, que, que quelque chose peut arriver. Parce que tu commences à banaliser les risques. Et puis, ça, ça peut être. C'est la chose la plus dangereuse que tu peux avoir en montagne, je pense. On, on, on se bat pour ne pas être obsédé par la, la prochaine avalanche ou être obsédé par la prochaine mauvaise chute ou la mauvaise réception ou j'en sais rien. 
Il y en a une ou deux, il y a eu des avalanches en Alaska et des avalanches euh, ici en Suisse. Je me souviens très bien le moment où je suis dans l'avalanche en train de me dire « Ouf, quel con là, je vais morfler ». Mais voilà, je n'ai pas le temps de stresser plus que ça. Ça se passe et puis on sait que pour le moment, ça va. Pour le moment, ça va et puis tout à coup, boum, ça va plus mais on se souvient de rien. Donc... Freeriding is a dangerous thing. I think that it's super important to build up that fear into people so that they realize that freeriding is magical, but freeriding at the same time can in a split second take your life. You're, you're close to a border where consequences are huge. So how, how good are you with playing close to that border with still doing smart decisions? It's for a lot of people not understandable, but if you have the experience, you can play more or closer to that line. Cette part de risque qui fait aussi que je me sens je me sens vivant à côté, ça fait on va dire que ça décuple en plus les sensations. Malgré ce que j'ai vu, ce que j'ai vécu aussi, ben je me j'arrive pas j'arrive pas à décrocher donc Je pense que quand les choses arrivent, on ne peut rien faire contre. Et, mais il faut surtout essayer d'avancer euh, le mieux possible avec des expériences de vie qui sont hyper violentes, très difficiles et parfois même où on a l'impression que ce sera insurmontable à, à, à accepter. Does the, the sport gives me back that much that the risk is worth it? Right now, I... I don't have the answer, but stopping is, is not an option. So, so I was up there and uh, I was just about to go over Bergstrand and the whole thing's cracked. I don't know if you can see the cracks, and I uh, kind of freaked out. So I'm just standing there. I'm safe, I think, because of this. But this is sheet ice. And the idea is to straight line it. Them, not me. I'm staying here. Hopefully. I'm not going down there. Hopefully. Seriously, you want to ride this? I think it was 10 years ago. Xavier got caught in this huge slide. So then he decided, why don't I start riding ice? Because where there's ice, there's pretty much no avalanche danger. And he decided that that was his thing. So for the next four years, all we did was try and find patches of ice to ride.
makes great footage. Don't know if it makes great skiing or snowboarding. A natural, a natural mountaineer. Natural born punter. Top five ski places. Well, Verbier for sure. La Terre de Baffin. La Turquie, c'était un truc complètement dingue. South America. Alaska. Antarctica. Lebanon, I love that. Les Alpes. Chamonix, definitely one of those best places in the world. The Aiguille du Midi. Explore the rock and roll of Pakistan. Le Triangle d'Or, c'est Verbier, Chamonix, Courmayeur. Zermatt. Kashmir, Georgie. Uh... Where I want to go back is Greenland. Zermatt. Italy in general, because of the great cappuccino in the morning. Bah, la numéro une. The Pyrenees in my little village. Sur Maricotte. Et l'Amérique du Sud. Georgia. Georgia. Il y a trop bon endroit au bon moment et les bonnes conditions. Japan. Japon. Japon. Euh, le Japon. Japan. Japan. Japan is just... just good. Yeah, for the powder, but also for, for the people and the food and the culture. Euh, le Japon, c'est obligatoire. If I had to take a ski holiday for myself, Japan would be the place I'd go. Best snow I've ever skied. Amazing culture, beautiful mountains, beautiful people. C'est clair, c'est c'est pas très alpin, mais euh, il neige tout le temps. If you just want to ski? It's the greatest place on the planet to go. I guess I've got to say Alaska. Alaska has become the mecca of free riding over the years. Days only just begun, so I think we're about to slay it. It's going to be sweet. Most of the times I've been there, it's been incredible. It's what, what I do, it's what you see in the movies. It's beautiful, beautiful lines, beautiful light, beautiful snow, and it's just an amazing place to go filming, an amazing place to go skiing. Last year we went to Georgia. And to me, Georgia is definitely in the top five ski areas I've ever been. It's like Alaska without the hype. It's got unbelievable mountains. Maybe not quite to the same level as Alaska, but we just maybe we just got lucky. But it's got amazing mountains, great skiing, plus it's got a cultural cultural side, and it's three hours away from here. Il faut absolument profiter de ce qu'on a dans les Alpes parce que c'est unique au monde, mais unique au monde. Il y a une espèce de richesse. Moi, je partirai jamais. Les cinq stations où, euh, qui seraient dans mon top 5, ce serait dans les Alpes, entre euh, Zermatt et Chamonix. C'est vraiment des endroits où tu peux aligner les dénivelés et ça, c'est super important. Je suis chauvin, mais... T'es vraiment vers les Alpes. Mmh. I've had the incredible fortune, I'd say, of going to Antarctica twice. First trip we went with Xavier and Jeremy Jones. Kind of just really just scratched the surface and saw what it was all about and it was incredible. And Xavier actually, so I'm blown away by it, but decided to organize this expedition and spend a month down there. And that, I've got to say, is one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. I think Antarctica was uh, the most complete adventure I did. 
know, with the whole traveling, the setting up the expedition, the human factor, the, the wildlife. And it was very much in the standard way of seeing an adventure, but it definitely fulfilled every kind of uh, expectations. It was pushing new boundaries in Antarctica, but it was also you know, having the right combination of being on the right boat with a guy that was the uh, that had been the first guy down there with, on a yacht. Uh, that was also the combination of the people on board. That was also the weather that we found. That was also the faces that we found that allowed us to push it so hard. And all these things put together made it like, like a very, very special trip. You could potentially get the best steep skiing on the planet. Plus you've got whales there, penguins there. It's just, it's just an incredible place. Everything we do is always is teamwork and the whole team has to think in a similar way and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and I've just had the fortune of working with groups of people that I think really work well together. How are you Try to dig myself to China and not be scared as of fucking rocks falling non-stop. It's a partnership, you know, it's like you don't go out there with anyone. And that's a difficulty I find, to find the people that you also want to work with in the mountains. We managed to make these films and it's not, it's not just me filming, it's three other cameramen sometimes. How big is that? 20 meters? Yeah, for sure. Pretty big, eh? Yeah, I would have done that, but kind of uh, too busy. Okay. Not today. Too busy. Well, working today. Working today. Tomorrow I think I might walk up there. And yeah, we'll, we'll come up and do it for fun. Yeah, but I'll go big. Oh, no. <laughs> Not pussyfoot around like he did. That was surprisingly wimpy for him. <laughs> Someone has an idea and then everyone else works together to make that idea work. At some point, we want to do a trip to, to Svalbard and then Alaska and we're deciding, okay, we're not, we don't want to use helicopters, but we're going to film from the air because aerial, the aerial angle for me has always been the, the key to some of the best shots. I, I kind of looked at parameters to start filming, you know, when there, was, when there were no drones and when there was nothing to film from the air in a remote location and, uh, and then like, Figuring it out, I discovered that it was a very stable tool that potentially could be used for scoping lines. That, that idea of the paraglider evolved from a shooting tool to, oh, hold on, why don't we, why don't we use the paraglider to access the lines? And then it went from, why don't we use the paraglider to just jump into a line and ride it? a natural progression. The, the whole like crazy idea where we jumped off a paraglider into a powdery Alaskan spine, it was just uh, mind-blowing. Another one of those ideas, off-the-wall ideas. Now we've got, everyone's got access to drones. Like, you know, we just sit in a restaurant and get the most incredible shot ever. You've got to embrace technology. 
and progress. And I don't know, what, what, what's the new thing? No idea. I still think quality rather than quantity. Do I? Not really. Now more about quantity rather than quality. <laughs>
Pour moi, le ski, c'est un plaisir. Il faut que ça reste un plaisir. C'est ma vie. J'ai vraiment vécu. Je, je vis. <rire> Last year, we went to Georgia, Sam and Marcus and Lewis Lemmett wanted to, um, to ski this unskied line on Mount Ushpa, which is a 4,700 meter peak. And originally, I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. And then for some reason, I talked myself into it. Now, I'd never planned to go this summer, but that's a time when I just thought, maybe I shouldn't be doing this anymore. I was definitely the weakest link. And you don't want to let the rest of the team down by being a bit useless. I still want to be in the mountains and I still want to film. So I think I'd like to take a sort of mellow approach if that's possible. <laughs> Merci, merci. Ah. <laughs>